All right, we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kathy Ullman. I have a big long title, it's not important. Um, I've been around for a long time. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this talk is really going to talk about, in part, the history of the mess that we're in with cybersecurity, right? I mean, who here knows that security is kind of a mess? Anybody know that? Anybody heard that? Yeah. Right? Security is a disaster. What the hell are we doing? If you don't know the history of computing, and you may know some of the history as far as like Apple and Microsoft and some of that, but if you don't know some of the other pieces of history, it may surprise you to realize that we got where we are because of where we've been. So you'll see that the first part of this talk is really intended to give you some of that background. So you understand kind of the mess we're in, especially when it comes to FUD, which is, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that's really what we're going to focus on. How did we get to this place of FUD? And then, okay, now that we're here, how can we get move away from it? So that's really the underlying theme today. These are the topics we're going to talk about. I'll talk just a little bit more about me. Um, you're welcome to ask me about me, but you don't want to hear about me. So if you have questions, I'll answer them, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. We're going to have to talk about the topic of fear in general and what it's supposed to do, what people think it does, and what it actually does. And those are very, very different things. There is some really uh, misguided information about what fear can do successfully. And a lot of marketing folks take advantage of that, and it's just not accurate. Um, we're going to talk about the cost of using that fear and the history of the fear that we see, consequences, and then how we can change that paradigm. How can we change the adventure we're on? How can we choose our own adventure to make it better? Um, what can we do moving forward? And then I'll give you some final thoughts. So me, I'm a sloth, but not really. Uh, this was, I need to update this slide actually. This was my sloth mini. Mini was a sloth at the Buffalo Zoo for many, many, many years. Uh, she unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, it's probably been five years now, I think. Uh, there is now another sloth at the zoo. She was one of five, and she was the, the one that, uh, one of the ones that lived the longest there. Um, Ethel was the, the most recent. But uh, yeah, sloths, love sloths. So he's really about me. I always like to start with sloths, cause, just because they're fun. So like I said, do some things, speak some places, um, and I love sloths. All right, so let's talk about you know, this, this notion of fear. Take a look at this advertisement from 1989. 1989 is, for some of us, 20 years ago, right? Because I know for all of us who like, grew up in around the 80s time frame, the 80s were 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now let's look at this one. Really different? Not so much, right? What do they have in common? Fear. Fear, right? They're, they're both trying to frighten you into doing something. They're both marketing campaigns for some kind of technology, something to get you to do stuff. They're radically different years. It's a huge time span, and yet none of it's changed. So what can we think, what do we think fear can do? Well, we do things like, we, we think it's going to change behavior. If I scare the heck out of you such that you don't want whatever it is you're afraid of, maybe you won't do the thing, right? So we do things like a lot of organizations will do simulated phishing tests because they think, if we scare people enough and they see the bad thing, it's going to make them stop clicking. How many believe it's going to make them stop clicking because they're afraid? Hmm, nobody's raising their hands. Funny that, right? Um, it's, it's an odd thing. And somehow it's going to bolster that change. But there's a cost associated with that. We spend a lot of money on InfoSec. Now, I updated the slides. I haven't given this talk in a number of years. The last time I gave this talk, we were still in the millions of dollars. That was like in 2017, 18. We're now in the trillions of dollars. And that's just in the last couple of years. 
the expectation going into 2022 now is even higher. We're spending so much money on this stuff to try to be safer. Guess what? It's not working. It doesn't matter how much money we're throwing at it. It's not effective. And, that, and part of the reason it's not effective is because some of what we're throwing money at is fear-based. So let's talk about something called blinky box syndrome. So some of you, I know Shecky knows Chris. So Chris Roberts, um, probably most infamous for hacking an airplane, uh, is a friend of mine who talks a lot about blinky boxes. And there's this whole idea that you buy a box that has a bunch of blinky lights, and you plug it in, and then what happens? It's a magic bullet. It's a magic bullet. What, what, I heard an answer. You're safe. You're safe, right? Blinky boxes are awesome. They're the easy button of security. Okay, so we'll come back to that. So here's what fear actually does. If you don't scare people enough, they get complacent. Because they're like, ah, you tried to scare me about the thing. I don't really care anymore. How many of you watch horror movies? Anybody in here like horror movies? Yeah, a couple of you? If you watch enough horror movies, do they become scary after a while? Not at all. Why? You've seen it all. You're you desensitized. You see it. You get desensitized. You don't care. And that's the same thing we see in security. If there's too much fear, you're so terrified, you can't think, you can't move, you're not going to act. It's not effective. So it creates this negative energy. It can create an over-response, right? This, this overactive response because we're so afraid that we can't do anything. So as I said, we're going to kind of go back in time here and we're going to see the history of how we got to where we are with the fear marketing that exists. It has always been by design. This is before we got to technology per se. Who can tell me what this picture is? Manzanar. What? Manzanar, the Japanese internment camp. The internment camps, right. Mm -hmm. In World War II, people were so terrified of Japanese Americans, we threw them in a camp and said, we're scared of you, we're sticking in this corner. And then the marketing that you see on the other side here, we're starting to see some of that now, even though it's not really the same. We're terrified of the Russians, right? The Russians are coming to get us. So fear by design is, is pretty common, unfortunately. Who remembers the Orange Book of Joy? Anybody? A few people? Yeah. So the Orange Book, anyone want to comment on what the Orange Book was? It was just the standards at the time. It was early standards. A list of things you have to do. Right. What you had to do was a government document. And it said, if you want to be secure, you have to do the following things. Nowhere in that book did it use the words information security, cybersecurity, none of that. It was policy stuff, controls. That's it, right? So here's the beginning of the internet. In the mid 80s, you had ARPANET starts to expand. Who can tell me about ARPANET? Anybody remember something about ARPANET? Where it started, what, what its purpose was? Go ahead, Dave. DOD funded project for four universities. Yep, DOD project for four universities with the idea that they wanted to create this network to back each other up because they were the only ones that had this computing power. There's a lot of bizarre myths about this was some sort of weird early cyber defense. No, they were researchers. That's the whole point. So these researchers were doing research and if this entity went down, this one wanted to be able to pick up the work. Yes? I also read that it was the government didn't want to buy specialized equipment for all these different universities, so they said, why can't you share it? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was certainly a cost-saving measure. Mm -hmm. But it initially, the whole, and, and that's certainly true as it expanded, but initially it was just meant to be like ba a backup mm -hmm. to each other. So as it expands, you get into something, uh, I, I mentioned BitNet here because this was my first experience. Uh, Dave's chuckling because he's familiar with this. But BitNet was one of the earliest networks that the SUNY system was on. So uh, for those of you not from around here, the State University of New York system, 
um, has a whole bunch of colleges and a bunch of them wound up getting connected to all of this through something called BitNet. Um, then you have the personal computer boom and companies using the internet. So I mean, this is like really fast forward through time, right? So where do the earliest security developments come into play? Well, as people start getting connected, they start to realize there might be some problems. And we have these early viruses, brain. It was a copyright infringement tool. That's all it was meant to do, except it actually wiped some files. That seems bad, right? And I'm sure some of you have at least heard the name McAfee, right? He's, he's no longer with us. And he actually in, figures out a way to undo what this virus does. And he gives it away for free. And then goes on to make gazillions of dollars, right, with, with antivirus. But he starts out on a bulletin board system giving the solution away for nothing. By the late 80s, you have more antivirus vendors than viruses, which is kind of nuts. So that's some of the early technology we see. The government jumps in. Government never overestimates the power of computing, right? Never. Computing can do all the things. It can take over the world. So the government gets very, very, very nervous. And they literally publish things that's, that call it potentially devastating weapon. This is early computing, folks. This isn't the matrix. This isn't the stuff we're seeing today. This is 1980s. I mean, for those of you who've even seen pictures of this, we're talking big, clunky machines. We're not talking anything nuclear. We're talking very basic but that was gonna ruin everything. Uh, and especially now that we've had COVID, I find this particularly interesting. The high technology equivalent of germ warfare, can you imagine? This is like computing COVID, oh no. The Morris worm hits, which is uh, one of the first most devastating worms in 1988, and it crashed one-tenth of all the computers on the internet. Now mind you, we're not talking about a ton of machines because the internet was like this big at that point. Um, and because that was so devastating, they set up the first CERT, which does computer security research at Carnegie Mellon. So there's already fear in place here, folks, and the government's fueling it in part because they're terrified. So not only is there fear, but there's now fear of external attack because we're not just talking about something on your on your desk that you're typing stuff into, we're talking about connectivity. And the cost of malware was, getting rid of it was so expensive that the whole idea of spending a few bucks on each machine, this doesn't seem unreasonable. If, if it costs me at the time a gazillion dollars in my corporation to have this removed from the machines that are there, then doesn't it seem reasonable that if I had to pay five to 10 bucks a machine to prevent that, this is you know, worth the cost of doing business. So we start to see pictures like this, there are books like this, and, and these are some of the first uh, books we see on internet firewalls. Because now we're having, we're starting to connect all the things, right? And there's this fear of the outside coming in and the outside, of course, being on the other side of the firewall. So we start to see these things in the early 90s. Who can tell me why this is important? Go ahead, Chucky. First World Wide Web Browser. First World Wide Web Browser. But, but what did that mean? It meant Who? more people were accessible. It was graphical in nature, so people could actually see things. And it made it easier for the general public to actually navigate Yes, the internet. exactly. So now your mother and your brother and your cousins and your uncles and your aunts and anyone who could afford a computer is now starting to get online. We're not talking about universities. We're not talking about places of research. We're not just talking about the government. We're talking about everyone. So the world really changes in 93. 
because everybody starts getting online. And don't you know, virus protection is just a matter of trust. So here we are, fast forward a little bit, and we're still seeing the same kind of messaging. What about those blinky boxes we talked about? So here's the beginning of your blinky box, right? We're so worried about attackers coming in, we need to put a blinky box in place to keep the attackers out. These are your early firewalls. So long before what we think of as firewall, we had this deck seal. It was a gateway. It was literally a door, essentially. It kept attackers out, and it was considered a fail-safe protection. Yay! And then in 95, Nick was like, <laughs> hold this, right? And he attacks the supercomputing center. Firewall, <laughs> who cares? And at that point, we have more panic. So how about today? Fast forward to today, which is, of course, many more than 20 years later. So the initial blinky box, not so effective because we had somebody like Mythic who was able to get around it. We now have even more technology. We're now spending even more money. We have all the money and we have all the blinky boxes. Is it any better? Yeah, no. Let's look at the numbers here. I just got this off the most recent report. So 68% from 2020 to 2021, that's bad. So it doesn't matter. We're putting more blinky boxes in place. We're doing all the things. We're spending all the money, and we're getting nowhere. Now that seems like a bad place to be. So what are the consequences? Well, FUD, I mentioned this in the very beginning, right? Lots of marketing strategies using FUD. They're providing this information, which we never hear about today. Um, there's discouragement of, of a competitor, so don't buy X, you should buy us because we're so much better. Um, there's the story of IBM versus Gene Omdahl. Does anybody know that story? Yeah? Well, Omdahl made a, a machine that basically did the same thing the IBM 360 did for a lot less money, and IBM said, no, you can't do that. But there's another piece to it. Okay. What else did they use about, the, what specifically did they use to try to say you shouldn't buy Amdahl's product? So Amdahl designed a computer that didn't have a fan in it. Mm. Why did he do that? Because he put the fan on the outside of the box. Or he put the, he, he put the power supply, excuse me, on the outside of the box. If the power supply is on the outside of the box, do you need a fan cooling it on the inside of the box? No. The whole point of the fan was to cool the power supply. So he actually designed it in such a way that it would be more efficient. IBM came along and said, you don't want to buy this thing. You'll burn your house down because there's no fan. No misinformation there, right? I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and I love this quote from, from Rich Smith uh, of Duo. The security industry generates FUD in order to sell hope. And I think that's pretty accurate. So here's another ex uh, quick example. Um, this is an actual ad about EMC and, you know, IBM. So I don't know if you, if you see. This is an actual IBM thing. So this is... <laughs> If you look carefully, internal use only, but you know, it was on the interwebs, so whatever. So this is a, an example about competitors, and this is very, very common. We have a really serious problem with fear, and it's not just the, the words we're using, it's also the images, and we fear what we don't understand. Who's ever seen anything like this? <laughs> oh yeah, never. I, I wanna know, who hacks like this, because that's pretty amazing. You can't see anything, you can't feel the keyboard. I mean, that's COVID impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Robot. 
Yeah, but even Mr. Robot doesn't do that, right? He just pulls his, his hoodie up. Maybe he's cold. I mean, you know, I have a hoodie too. And it's a black hoodie. So this brings up the point, and, and I, I, I mention this, I know in some cases I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. Dave's heard this a million times. My husband's heard this a million times. The media loves to use the word hacker in a pejorative way, which is bad. Because the whole idea of being a hacker is understanding how something actually works, not just the way it's intended to work. It's important to realize that the media is what's twisted that. And while it is really hard to change that, because getting the media to listen to anything is, is difficult, um, it's important to understand, especially within the context of security, that there are a lot of us who are hackers who are very proud of that. We enjoy what we do. We love to learn. It's, it's a passion for us. And that's a good thing. I bring this up because of fear. Hackers are bad. No. In the dev world, my, my husband here is a developer, and he sees issues in the dev world. If you don't do it right, and you blow up your, your company, essentially, because your code is bad, and you blow up the product, that's terrifying. So there's fear in all of these places. They don't teach security foundations in most CS programs. That's a problem for developers. And if you need extra time for code review, for security stuff, heaven help you, because a lot of companies don't want to spend the time doing that. So even in the dev world, we have this issue. It's a growth area. It is a growth area. It needs to grow exponentially. <laughs> um, consistency has been, our, been a flaw for us. So unlike a lot of other entities uh, where consistency is a good thing, right? So like, um, especially in an area, say, like banking or medical care, consistency is really important. Um, consistency winds up being a flaw for us because it's a business afterthought. We keep doing this the same way. We buy a blinky box because we think it's going to fix things. Um, we work against the folks who are actually doing jobs in our organizations, and we're not teaching security to CS folks. So that seems kind of like insanity to me if we're going to do the same thing over and over, and we want different results. And the same goes for the fear messaging. When we don't understand something and we're really scared, it becomes anger. We get angry about what we don't understand. And uh, that turns to hate. So that's really not ideal. If you're using fear to try to get folks to do what you want them to do, that way leads to the dark side. We don't want to do that. All right, how many of you in here are in the business in some capacity of cybersecurity? A good chunk of you, right? So, nope, this is, this is a heart, but it says hate you. I saw that. I saw that right away. All right. So this is going back a little ways, this particular study. But these are ways in which security departments are thought of. Have you ever heard these things since you're in security, right? We're doom mongers. We're called the Department of No. The Department of No. Yes. And, and I took that very seriously. Um, we are a very, very small department at the University of Buffalo, and I made it my mission when I moved into that office to make it the Department of Yes But, which is a much better message because it tells the folks I'm working with, I'm not here to tell you no. I want to understand your business process. I want to help you do what you're doing, and I want you to do it more safely. So how can we achieve that, right? But this is the messaging that people often get. We're policemen. When we put new rules in place, they're seen in a negative light. We don't explain what they are. We're reactive, we're not an asset, and we just keep the lights on, which is pretty cool, because you know what? <laughs> it doesn't work when the lights are on or off. It doesn't really matter. So I think this is a fun definition of InfoSec. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can tell you from a personal note that uh, one of the best things about moving into security is 
I don't do PC support anymore, sorry, I can't help you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so how can we change this overall paradigm? How can we get away from the fear-mongering, the wrong kind of messaging, so that we're seen in a better light, so that we're more effective in what we do? We're going to overcome it in a number of ways. We need to be honest with the folks we're working with about risk. And sometimes less is more. So they don't, when we're communicating risk, especially to folks who are not in security and not in IT, and even people who are in IT but aren't in security, they don't need to know everything we know. Think about that with your messaging. Like we may know, um, how many of you know there was, say, a Microsoft Zero Day recently? Anybody hear about that? Just a few of you? Okay. I don't start panicking my IT teams going, oh my god, zero day, end of the world. Right? This is not effective. I don't even tell them how easy it is to do the thing. I explain to them, this is a problem. We are at significant risk from this problem, so let's talk about what we can do about it. They don't need to know the details at that moment. They have eyes, they can research it. You don't need to spend lots and lots and lots of time on this. And the more you go down that chain into the user space, the more important that is. They really don't need to understand some of this. They need to understand what they need to know for their jobs. Most folks in end user positions want to know how it impacts them. If it doesn't impact them, it doesn't matter to them, and that's okay. And that's really hard to grasp when your brain is always in that space, right? You're always like, okay, risk, 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 risk. But they don't care, and that's okay. We need to provide power, empowering messages, how folks can help themselves and you to make things better. Be an advocate and get folks to advocate with you. If you can create advocates in, like, we're, you know, we're a huge shop. If you're in a place that has a lot, of, a lot of different departments and you can find folks that are like security champions, that's huge. So if you can encourage best practices and you can do it in this positive way, you're going to have a much, much, much better outcome. There is this notion of us versus them. Security is this. Everyone else is that. Nope. We're all in this together. Don't care if you're in security. Don't care if you're a cafeteria worker or bus driver. It doesn't matter. We're all in this together. And we all have different roles to play. One of my favorite stories um, from my past. So I worked with actual rocket scientists, folks that made rockets go into space. And you know what? Those people are freaking brilliant. You know what they're not really good at? Security. Well, not even just security. <laughs> Explaining themselves? <laughs> well, <laughs> but it depends on what you're asking them about. What rocket scientists are not particularly good at, necessarily, PCs are not their wheelhouse. That is not what they do. It is a tool to do what they do, but PCs is not their bread and butter. And so I had to explain to folks who were, in many ways, way smarter than I was, how to make a PC go. And so what I wound up doing is we traded information. I would explain to them why something mattered. And they would go, oh. And then they would explain to me a little bit about rocket scientists, and what they do, and why what they do matters. And that this exchange of ideas is huge. And it's so much more effective. You have to be patient with folks. If they ask you a question and you need to do follow through, make sure you follow through. The worst thing you can do is go, yeah, yeah, I'll get back to you on that and drop the ball because you lose trust. And the minute you lose their trust, now you've ruined that path. So the idea here is to illuminate folks and help build that community of trust. Make sure you're communicating with them at the level they both understand and can relate to. And in many, many cases, that means telling stories and I hate the concept dumbing it down, because it's not about dumbing it down. It's about exploring the world wherever they are. And if they're not technical, or they're not in this piece of technology, or they're 
you know, uh, the end user just trying to get their job done, again, you need to think about where they are and coming into their space and talking to them in a way they will understand. Because everything else is ineffective. It's trying to scare the crap out of them does not work. This is not effective, right? Somebody's screaming at you, and probably you're never going to hear them. So we want to replace fear with a healthy skepticism. We don't want people to be afraid. Being afraid is not effective. Being skeptical is. And one of the things I always respond to people, I'm responsible for abuse at buffalo.edu. Please don't spam me with crap because we get enough of it already. But, you know, I am one person, and I'm the one who answers all the queries that come into that address. If somebody sends me something and they've realized it's bad or they're asking, is this bad, I always respond with, thank you for being skeptical and suspicious. Because it says to that person, hey, you did the right thing. You reached out and asked the question. I always tell folks, I would so much rather you ask, then oops. Right? Because if you ask, I can help educate you. If you oops, now I have to help clean the mess up. Which doesn't mean they won't oops. It means they're less likely to oops. And you're building that trust where they're more likely to ask. If they feel like they're going to be somehow persecuted for asking the question or, you know, doing the wrong thing, they're never going to ask. They're going to, they're going to fall into that space of fear where they're paralyzed. I don't want anybody to think I'm doing the wrong thing. And I don't want to say anything because I don't want to get yelled at, so I'll just do nothing. Yeah. There's always going to be people who oops. So Correct. you have to make it comfortable for them to come forward yes. and say, hey, I made this oops. Yep. They're always going to, absolutely 100%. Comment was, if you didn't hear it, there are always going to be people who oops. That's just the nature of the beast. But if you can make it comfortable enough for them to come forward when that happens, so much better. So much better. And if you're in an organization where you feel like you have to do self-fishing type exercises, as I hear this, I, this is a, an ongoing discussion in a variety of, of, of online spaces I'm in. Fishing exercises are crap. Well, we have to do them. Well, they don't do any good. Hmm. Yes, some organizations have to do that. Yes, they can be crap. But what is the goal with your self-fishing exercise? The goal of a self-fishing exercise should never be to see how many people you can catch. That is not the point. What you want with self-fishing, if you need to do it, is you want people to talk about it. Hey, I got this message. It looks like crap. This looks like garbage. I'm suspicious of this. You shouldn't click on that. And even if it's a test, that's awesome. The more people talk about it, the less likely you're going to have people clicking on it. It doesn't mean they'll never click. But getting the word out means IT will probably find out that much faster. So communicating is key. So get people to be skeptical. Get them to ask questions. Play devil's advocate where it's appropriate. So I think this is kind of fun. So Arthur Conan Doyle, one of his Sherlock Holmes stories, he talks about the difference between seeing and observation. Can anybody tell me what that distinction might be? How many of you work in a building that has stairs? One, two, okay, handful of people. How many of you can tell me how many stairs there are between when you walk into the building and when you sit down at your desk. You don't count. <laughs> All right. How many of you see those stairs like five days a week, or at least you used to maybe, you know, pretty regularly? Yeah. Most of us see the stairs, but we're not making that acute observation. We're not paying attention to those finer details. And that's a big difference. So we need to teach folks how to start paying attention to those fine details so that they start to pay attention to those fine details, which can be tricky. It's not their job to be security analysts. They're not going to pick apart an email header. But they should recognize when something looks a little funky. So we want them 
Outside of InfoSec, generally speaking, and this goes for everybody, we want folks to start questioning stuff on websites. Don't just believe everything you see, right? Question legit legitimacy of an email. If it came from somebody who looks like your boss, but this message looks weird, maybe you should go, hmm, maybe this isn't legit. We get uh, spoofs of folks all the time. Uh, they're gift card scams. This is like a regular thing. We get um, employment scams that come through that purport to come from somebody at UB. They need to be aware of these online risks, and it can't just be once a year. So the more often, and this is a conversation we're having right now, because we're going to be moving toward some sort of university-wide training, uh, cybersecurity training. And I have told my boss in no uncertain terms, this cannot be a one and done. It's, you know, sexual harassment training is fine. You can do that one and done. And it's important to be reminded this message needs to come in different ways at different times where you don't just sit and go click, 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 click. So how can we do that? And that's really important. There needs to also be healthy skepticism within InfoSec. So it's not just them. It's also us. And again, we're all in this together. We need to be skeptical of marketing materials that say things like, you know, protects you from all the badness. Can stop all zero days. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Because I know it stops all zero days. I'm good. If I buy that blinky box, what's the most? Can anybody uh, think of, so if your, your original blinky box is the firewall, what was one of the next blinky boxes? Picks. Well, a Pix was, was, was a fancier version of the firewall. Yeah, what, what came after that? Uh, IDS. Yeah, IDS, exactly. So we had, you know, IDS, and then now, now where are we? What kinds of blinky boxes do we buy now? AI overlords. AI overlords, <laughs> right? Anytime you see AA, especially AI, so, so Chris Roberts, the one I mentioned earlier, he is fond of saying, Nothing is AI until it can tell me what kind of tea it likes. <laughs> it can be machine learning, but it's not tree AI until it can tell you that. So be skeptical of that stuff. Um, you know, speak out against that negative image because those of us who are hackers, I think, have a lot to give. And we're excited about what we do. We love what we do. And we want to give back. So don't shut us down. And avoid relying on scary words because we never we never hear this right advanced persistent threat that's like never a thing i just love when the news media is like oh it was an apt how do most apts start like phishing email phishing email right okay i'm an apt what does that mean nation state potentially nation state but but what does the apt part of apt really mean Act. You're, they're hanging out inside your network. No. Now that doesn't sound as scary as APT, right? Advanced persistent threat. Just means they're hanging out in the network. Okay, not good, but not nearly as scary sounding. There is no APT. It's just persistent threats. <laughs> the advanced is the worst part of it. Yeah, I mean, there's this idea that you know that this is this is some kind of advanced, terrible, horrible thing. And the reality is, it's probably the same thing that's been going on. I can tell you, I've been in this business a long time. I get asked all the time, how do you stay on top of all this stuff? And I'm like, it hasn't changed in 40 years, folks. It really hasn't. It's the same stuff. Yes, okay, definitely there are some new twists. But the core of this stuff hasn't changed in a long time. So staying on top of it is really just sort of like, oh, they turned it on their head this way, and they turned it on its head that way. And once you kind of get that core... It just doesn't change much. So we go to this idea of nuanced learning. So change your verbiage. We're not going to catch people. We're going to partner with them. Remove the us versus them language. Use things like we. We together are stronger. And it sounds lame. I get it. But it matters. It really does. So when you're doing... Any kind of like reporting, what I tell people is if you're doing some sort of phishing reporting, 
Don't report on who clicked the link. Tell me who didn't click the link. I don't need to know individuals, but if I'm giving you messaging, if I'm saying to you in the business community, we had 25% of our people clicked the link. That sounds pretty bad, right? Like a quarter of your people clicked the link. What if I said to you, 75% of your people didn't click the link? Which one of those two messages is likely to get more people to not click the link? And even the tools we buy, like Know Before and some of these packages, their reporting shows up with all this negative crap. And it's terrible, but it's all this FUD that we've grown up with. So obviously, yeah. Um, so a lot of, some of my role is uh, for clients, I'll do phishing campaigns. Mm -hmm. And I really want to highlight exactly what you said. These are the people that did not click. But my clients frequently ask, I want to know who did. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell them, um, so let, why don't we focus on the good things? I know in your mind, one, even one click is bad. Um, but it, at the end of the day, they're paying me. And uh, some people will say, I, I don't want to work with you if I don't give that. Do you have any thoughts on how to frame this so that I can not throw people under the bus and praise people for what they do real well. So I would tell them two things. I would say, I am happy to give you statistics that provide what you're looking for. Because I think it's okay for them to understand that they do have a percentage that click. But I think it's also important for them to understand there's always going to be a percentage that clicks. And it is a much better message to say, today we have 75% of our people who didn't click. Tomorrow we want 80% of our people who didn't click. So it's not that you can't tell them that there's that 15%. It's that we want you to understand this in a way that you can get your people to not click, right? And the way you're going to get them to not click is for them to want to be reinforcing a positive message always is more effective than reinforcing a negative message. So I, I think the trick is to tell them that you'll tell them what they want to know but encourage them when they're sharing messaging with their organization if they want people to improve. And, and I can send you, if you hit me up, I can send you some studies that talk about this because I got a lot of this from Jessica Barker who's written a fair amount about this. Um, there have been a number of psychological studies that show that the more you provide positive reinforcement, you are significantly more likely to get that outcome than with a negative reinforcement. And the, and the fear and the negativity are not going to get them what they want. So I, I guess that's part of it, right? Ask them what their goal is. And if their goal is ultimately for people to be better, then that's, what they, that's why it's important for them to focus on. If they want to focus on what's bad, OK, but what does it buy them? And I, I think that's a question I would ask. Like, OK, I, I, I'll tell you that 15% of your folks clicked. Great. What are you going to do with that? How are you going to make that better? And if their answer is, well, you know, we have to put the hammer down, ask them how they think that's going to, you know, affect things. Well, the org can terminate folks who are repeat clickers. Yep. And then on paper, they can show, hey, we're more secure because we got rid of our... Which is an absolutely problem terrible... Problem. Yeah. It, it's a terrible it's, practice. It's, you're always going to have clickers. I mean, you're right. It, people do that, and it's terrible. And then you hire more people to turn into clickers. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so I, terrible, and that's why... Yeah. my main hesitation is when they ask specifically for names of people, I don't want to give you this. I want to give you statistics. Um, here's, here's where you did well. Here are statistics. Yeah. These ones didn't do great. Yeah. And I've had a couple orgs that say we want to know specific names. And I've made a, a, a verbal agreement that I will give you these names under the agreement that this is not going to be something for termination. I'm not throwing you people under the bus. Yeah. Um, and that has worked well. But I would love to give them, here's, here's another way to frame it. Yeah. So maybe I might take you up on some of those studies that I can send. Yeah, them. yeah, just hit me up yes. and I'll send you. Sure. I, I would like some of that information as well. Um, it's important to make the environment comfortable for the people making mistakes. Yep. And yep, we, exactly. We kind of touched on that before because they're gonna, it's going to happen. Yeah. So you have to make it comfortable for them to say, oh, I clicked on that. Yep. 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 And... The people in the organizations want to know because they need, they want to know who needs additional training, or maybe didn't take the training, or you know just did it. I mean, so typically you're going to have two categories of people. You're going to have people who don't care, and no matter what you do, they're not going to care at the end of the day. 
and you have people who are just ignorant. You can help the people who are ignorant. You can't help the people who don't care. Of course. That's just the way it is. And there's only so much you can do. So in the cases of the people who don't care, you can put in whatever mitigations you can put in. That's, those are your options, right? You can fire them, which I think is ridiculous. Or, you know, maybe you set them up so that they work, they do all their web browsing work in a VM. And when they blow up the VM, you just replace that VM with another VM. I mean, there's a bunch of ways you can do it, but it's complicated. So we're, we're wrapping up here a little bit. Um, operationally, we need to look at some of these basics, um, which I say basic, but they're really fundamental. It doesn't mean they're easy. Uh, you need to know where the stuff is, and that is the data and the systems. Um, re you know, remove the easy ways in, uh, which, you know, like RDP. Um, we, there needs to be log monitoring. We need to fix the, the things we can fix that are reasonably simple. But don't let the goal of perfection override the good. If you can't do it perfectly, you shouldn't be like, well, I can't do it perfectly, so I'm not doing it at all. Nope. No one can do anything perfectly. I'm a big fan of this idea that security is a verb. Anyone heard that before, other than my husband? <laughs> security is a verb, folks. It's not a place you can get to. It's not a state. You're never going to be secure. It's something that's a doing. It's a being. It's something that we constantly work at. But you're never going to get to this mythical place of secure. And thinking anything else is pointless. We need to get back to the basics of education. We need to get that stuff into the curriculum. You know, Al, I know, is, is working on some of that. As hard as I can. Yep. Uh, and Dave as well. So, um, you know, we, UB is very fortunate. We have a network defense course that starts to teach kids in all different, it's a, it's a joint thing between the computer science and the school of management, but we have kids from all different, students from all different areas that participate, which is awesome. You know, we, we want self-evaluation for CS type stuff and communication of security issues, you know, more for expertise and moving forward. Change is hard. And we kind of started the talk with these ideas, right? InfoSec's a mess. We haven't had any Eureka moments. Why is that? Well, we're trying to change people. And changing people is really hard because we're creatures of habit. But be aware that a bunch of little changes can be really beneficial, even if they're small. And these small changes can snowball, but that doesn't mean that it makes them easy. So we need everybody to participate. We mentioned this a little early, I mentioned this a little earlier. We need to we need to partner with folks. It's not IT and InfoSec, it's us together working to be more secure generally. So think about it as a neighborhood watch. We need to partner with the next generation. Right? Kids that are coming up, seven, eight, nine, they're smart. They're very smart. And we need to teach them early. We need to get them involved. And I'll tell you, I'm not a huge fan of all the STEM things, because I think that excludes a lot of other key important things. But anywhere that we can get that generation engaged, uh, we have a summer camp that uh, is coming up. We're, we're, we're working with kids that are like middle school age but even younger, just depending on where you can engage them. They're you know, less set in their ways. It's just a lot easier. So here are some ways. Uh, you know, depending on the age of the kid, bring them to a B-Sides. There are things like coder dojos. There's cyber camps like what we have, Odyssey of the Mind, Hacks for Kids, any kind of mentoring. This is really important. So here are some final thoughts. To me, Security is about education. That is my number one job. And it doesn't matter whether I'm educating an end user, a sysadmin, a fellow security person. We are there to educate, not adjudicate. We are not there to pass judgment. We are not there to say you did the bad thing. We are there to say, oh, OK, this, this could be problematic, but, but let's talk about it. Let's see how we can you know, make it better or, or how this is going to impact. Because as you mentioned, on multiple occasions, 
If you can't open that door of communications, people are not going to come to you and they oops. And that is a much, much bigger risk to an organization. Learn what you know and trade the knowledge, like what I said about you know, the folks I work with who are rocket science. And be that change you want to see in the world, because if you don't, no one else will. And with that, my handle on Twitter is Investigator Chick, because apparently Chick, which is my full handle, is one letter too long. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Well, one, a lot of what you say sounds like you know, you're dealing with like, people at the university or something like that, or an organization. And I'm also thinking about the poor folks at home. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Um, I have an anecdote real quick just to show you how. Um, so my husband is, I've taught him, I said, don't click on emails, don't do this, don't do that. You know, ask me, like you say. And so he does, and uh, things pop up, and he asks me, and so forth. One day I called him up, and I said, how are you today? He says, I'm on the phone. I'm talking to tech support. Oh, no. And my <laughs> blood just <laughs> ran cold. Oh, I didn't have... I found a, uh, a friend who took me home, and I raced in there to hear an Indian voice on the phone. And I, you know, oh my gosh, it was it was like talk about fear. Yeah, I about had a heart attack that day. Unfortunately, he had just downloaded AnyDesk and had not logged on to his bank account yet. <laughs> but I was like, oh my God, it was over the top. So you know, there in same thing happened to my mother too. Yep. Microsoft called up and said, we need your credit card because... <laughs> Social engineering's tough. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. It I, is. You know, it's it's just horrible. But, you know, you, it, and you hear yeah. these stories on the news, right? And, and it's very easy to say, to say to loved ones, oh, my God, you know, what the heck's wrong with you? Why did you do this? <laughs> and the reality is they don't do this for a living. This is not their wheelhouse. Right. How will they know if you don't educate them? So yeah, I mean, that, it's, a, it's a great example. And, and I try to use, um, so even folks that I, I used to do desktop support for, some of them I'm friends with on Facebook, and I periodically get opportunities to educate them. Um, and I do that in very public spaces because I, I figure other people are probably reading. Um, but you're right. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in a corporate environment or you're at home, mm -hmm. it's the same kind of messaging. You don't want to scare the heck out of people, it's not a fact. And the, the last thing I want to mention is that I think the fear factor is going up because we're getting more and more crap all the time. Yep. I'm getting text messages saying, you know, we've renewed your uh, Geek Squad right. yep. subscription. Yep, all, we get I, it from all angles. All the time. It's yep. just like... And that's the whole point of the healthy skepticism, right, is it doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter what mechanism comes in. You should be questioning what you see, even if it's on a personal device, even if it's a place you always go, even, even, even start asking those questions. So instead of just being terrified of all the things going wrong, be more observant and do less seeing and more observing. There's a question, Al? In my security class, I was trying to explain about social networking is as old as human interaction, and you can see the same kind of strategies used in a social networking campaign as you see in a book a ninja's how to get guards to walk away from their posts. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, social networking, uh, you know, social engineering in all cases uh, has been around forever and, um, and it's definitely not new. It's just put into new context. Yeah. So I want to wrap up because Shecky's up next. Uh, but thank you so much for coming and, and hearing what I have to say and feel free to, to reach out. Um, I'm, I'm reasonably easy to find. Twitter is probably the easiest, uh, but uh, you can, you know, feel free to find me at the university as well. So, thank you so much. Well,